I'm Joyce Hornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Hornady Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Swerzik, and today we're filming live at the Safari Club International Show here in beautiful Nashville, Tennessee, having a great time. Joining me today, I have Marketing Director Neil Davies and special guest Mike Robinson. Guys, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, buddy. Uh, awesome to be here. I've wanted to do it for ages. Yeah, well, we're glad to have you in, in a cool venue. I mean, the SCI show is, one, it's always fun. We always look forward to that, and we certainly appreciate what Safari Club International does for the world of hunters. But this show specifically, Nashville's been a great city for this. They always turn out with you know a good crowd. People are you know booking hunts and, and spending money and, and seeing what we have. And so it's just a fun show all the way around. Oh, yeah. I think it's great. Yeah, it's just an international showcase for uh, conservation through hunting. And SCI does a fantastic job. The safari part of the name of the club is something that maybe people don't understand. Look, it's as, it's as much about turkey hunting and deer hunting in Nebraska and Missouri as it is hunting uh, markhor in far off places like Pakistan. So, I mean, it is a hunting organization. Yeah, I, I think. I think the key word there is, and I think a lot of people don't realize that the Swahili word safari mm. translates directly to English as journey. Yeah. Oh, wow. And so uh, a safari means a journey. And what is hunting, if not a journey into food, conservation, you know, camaraderie, et camaraderie experience. And, and I think that's, that's, that's to me, one of the key words, actually. Yeah, I agree. And I, you know, admittedly, as a young man growing up in this industry, I see Safari Club International. I have the same thoughts like safari. Okay. I'm not going on safaris. Well, that, that could mean, yeah, the safari to Zimbabwe. Or it could mean your 40 acres that you're shooting whitetail yeah. deer out of in the Midwest. It definitely spans a lot of things. And conservation, you know, it, it knows no country. It knows no state. It is a an idea um, that we need to, you know, And there And there's promote. local chapters. I mean, we have a Nebraska chapter. There's yeah. chapters in the UK. There's chapters all over the world. And the chapters spend quite a bit of time doing work locally as yeah, well. Room, yeah, excellent. So before we derail and spend all afternoon talking about Safari Club, which is as good as that is, and, you know, really... I'm excited to have Mike on as a guest, uh, you know, getting to know Mike and, and everything that you're involved in. I'm going to miss some things, but uh, <laughs> Michelin starred uh, sh- restaurateur, entrepreneur, uh, show host of Farming the Wild. Um, I mean, I'm sure I'm missing a bunch of things. So tank, Mike, collector. Tank, yes. collector. Yeah, tank collector. Tank collector. Tank uh, collector. So Mike, <laughs> among what I just said, what else uh, do you do before we get into your... your... So we have, a, we have a sort of group of businesses that all connect very tightly. Okay. And we're out of them. Sorry. Sorry. In listener. England, I, I live in uh, an area called the Cotswolds in England, southern West England. Um, but really, I do stuff all over the UK. In okay. Fact, and with my TV work with Farming the Wild, we go over it. We've, yeah. I've hunted with Neil a lot. I've... I'm all over, you name it. I was in Scotland with Neil and Jason, what, two months ago, three months ago? Yeah, in October. Yeah, yeah that was October. amazing. Wading through bogs, watching Jason disappear underwater. Oh, yeah, that's goals. right. He did. Yeah, that I was hilarious. That. That. Yeah. In- he thought he was stepping, like, it was just this little <laughs> creek, a little little brook, you know, nothing. Just a little drainage. And it looked like you just could step in it and step over. He, no, he stepped in it and went right up to his chest. He wondered why we'd both gone round, and he yeah. decided to take a shortcut. <laughs> yeah. Holding my rifle, that's what course. I was worried about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's part of the journey. <laughs> that's part of the journey, yeah. Right. Certainly his journey that yeah. day, I can tell you. Aquatic that day. <laughs> so, um, but no, so so there's, for me, there's Farming the Wild, which is, I adore doing with Outdoor Channel, which is a journey into what we do. It just follows our day, everyday travails of trying to manage wild deer in the UK and then the circular system I have, which I've developed over 20 years of managing the land right the way for the deer, right the way through to selling it on a plate in the restaurant and all the various different stopping points off during that mm-hmm. journey. And there's a few of them. You know, the, the, one of the key ones now is our, our wild venison business. Because look, the big difference between the UK and the US yeah. is I can take wild venison and sell it to the public. Right? It's a wonderful thing. Well, we have to, because we've got to kill a million deer a year at least, and we only have 40,000 hunters. 40,000 hunters yeah. can't eat a million deer. I'm not a mathematician, <laughs> but yeah, that doesn't pencil and I mean, out. The, so the landowners need to control the, the numbers on their, on their properties, <laughs> yeah. and they can dictate how much or how little people are going to take off the property. Um, you don't have to have hunting licenses over there. We had Simon Barr on here at one point, and he kind of went mm-hmm. through some of that. Folks with gun licenses can go out and do all this hunting, and they rely on them to control the game. Obviously, they run into the same issues we do. 
uh, human wildlife conflict out on the roads, all these things. Yeah. And then uh, the other thing that can happen, obviously, is if the game gets too abundant, then they start to get illness and then you get, they wipe out. Yeah. And so average weights decrease, you see a lack yeah. of condition. I mean, look, the biggest problem is we're a tiny country. I mean, it's sort of the size of Wisconsin or something. And we have 70 million people and probably between three and four million deer across the whole of the UK and Southern Ireland. So if you took the landmass as a whole, forgetting the country boundaries, you know, but the biggest problem, ironically, is everybody in the US thinks of deer Scotland, right? Right. Yeah, red deer. They, yeah. They, 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 trust me, they, they have some issues with deer in Scotland, but they have a historic management tool in place to harvest deer. In Southern England's a nightmare. Um, mm. We have areas that uh, thermal drones have said, oh, areas where there are 50 and 60 deer per square kilometer wild deer. Well, I mean, that there's roe, there's uh, mutt jack, you've got fallow deer. Yeah. I mean, there's That a, sounds very unsustainable. It is. Mm. Yeah. And there are areas now where post-lockdown, the lockdown we saw a massive jump in deer numbers because the way it works, put very simply in Britain, you have, I am asked by a landowner to harvest the deer on a piece of land. Fallow deer, unfortunately, are very transitory. So you can't just say there are 200 deer on that property because- one day there are 200 and one day there are eight because they're three miles away on someone mm. else's property. There are very few large land holdings. Most of them are you know, a few hundred to a thousand acres. I'm very lucky that I manage some large land holdings where actually the deer tend you to live be there. in residence. Okay. Much easier to manage. Mm. But where you've got smaller ones, they go from... The, farmer X might have a different policy than farmer Y. So, oh, that just and compounds farm, things. So farmer X's deer think, I'm safe here. So at night, when you're not allowed to shoot them, they go on to farmer wise and they just go bananas. So I try to bring people together. And I also say to them, look, at the moment, you, you know, you've got a chap who stalks the deer, right? That chap uh, takes those deer to what we call a game dealer. You call them a processor who buys the deer off. Them. They have to have certifications and things like that. But let's just say they buys the deer or whatever, not very much. And then that game dealer figures out how to skin and sell them. The issue is that they are all, since Brexit particularly, we've got a perfect storm of things. We've got Brexit, can't export them anymore with ease. Uh, we've got a massive growth in numbers since lockdown because all the restaurants were shut for nearly two years. Mm -hmm. And that was 50% of all the deer yeah. went to restaurants. So I predicted this when it was happening. And so that's when we set up Deerbox. And now what we do is we go to landowners and say, look, we can solve this problem because I guarantee to sell every deer I kill. Guarantee. But we don't try and sell to restaurants. We are, my goal is to sell to the general public, 70 million of them, mm -hmm. get them eat. And I'm on a crusade to get them eating wild venison. Absolutely. And so I do that in every way I can. So we are selling, Deerbox sells them in box scheme. So we will have, we've got three master butchers constantly packing. Right now, this week, we'll process 100 fallow deer. Wow. Every week, relentlessly for six months. And these are, these are wild, well, hunted wild animals. Wild hunted. Yeah. Hunted. Yeah. And by the way, they're not dumb. They don't stand going, Ugh. Yeah, you know, these are, they're still a wild animal. Oh, and they are psychotic. They're, they're oh, mental. Yeah. They're crazy. But some people have said to me, oh, fallow are easy to shoot. No, they're not. Like any deer, you put them, you've, you've done it yeah. enough with me. Yeah. We've been run ragged by fallow deer. Yeah, and they run off. I mean, there's big herds of them, and <laughs> yeah. if one takes off, they're oh, all gone. It's like antelope. Yeah, yeah. Pretty much. yeah, you spook one antelope, you've got the whole herd going. And, and we've seen herds, and I've been hunting them, Neil, and... Neil's been coming actually with me to this piece of land for nearly 15 years and we've seen this place and you know yeah we see I saw a herd two days ago I was harvesting fallow on this place I saw a herd of 300 fallow deer on a farmer's wow. field and that herd's famous because the farmers I won't say where it is the farmer's good lady wife will not allow a deer to be shot on that property mm. well that's yeah that's uh, kind of the one of the points of conservation is if you uh, if you love that deer more than you love the idea of deer you can create a, a situation where like neil you mentioned communicable disease yeah, is exactly. going to be a problem yeah. and then, like you mentioned the lower body weight uh fascinating stuff and we're going to get more into that yep. but before we go too far i want the listener to really get to know mike robinson so mike where did you grow up and when did you get into the outdoor space were you running around as a kid into this thing or what happened what was the transition like so i grew up only about half an hour from where I live now in southern England, in a little rural village. In fact, it's a well-known rural village because it's where Kate Middleton comes from. Oh, okay. So we, we're from the royal village, actually. Oh, Although, very much. I'd very, like to say yeah. I was there before she was. Yeah. And, uh, and my family were there for 60-odd years. And 
I own, I bought, so growing up there, I grew up as a voracious reader. The written word is what got me into this. Mm. I grew up reading adventure stories from Africa and I, I was born, I, I felt a hundred years too late. So <laughs> I had no idea what I wanted to do in my life, but I knew I wanted to hunt and I wanted to hunt and eat food I hunted from the age of 10. Oh, wow. My first thing I hunted was a rabbit with an air rifle in the garden. And then I made a rabbit korma curry with it because my mum would go to the supermarket and buy ready meals. And one of the famous ready meals was chicken korma. So I was like, yeah. I'm going to make a rabbit korma. Yeah. And it was probably awful. But I remember <laughs> that was one of the first things I made. That's fascinating and at that young of an age mm, to have that type of clarity. But my parents were not hunters. My granddad okay. had been a big hunter, but he died before I was born. I never met him. But I inherited his guns, his shotguns. Mm -hmm. and, but I didn't shoot a deer until I was 30 years old. <laughs> And, and uh, I met this amazing butcher game dealer, a guy called Alan Hayward, who's still one of my dearest friends. And I bought my country pub, the Bot Kiln, and I knew that I wanted to do something different at that pub from day one. Huge financial risk. 2005, I wanted to cook wild food. So I said to this guy, and turned out he'd set up two miles away, built this factory, and I'd said, so we became friends overnight. And he said, I will teach you to hunt deer. So he taught me how to hunt deer. Wow. So um, you were in the restaurant game before you were a big game Yeah, hunter. I was a restaurant chef from the age of 22. Okay. And then from the age of about 30, when I opened my first, bought my first place myself, I was like, I know what I want to cook. Wow. And venison has always since then been the core of everything I do. Okay. And um, be it Munjack, Rodeo, Fallow, Disney, could do any of the ones. I don't care. They're all great in their own way. Mm -hmm. um, what really changed things was... After about a year of hunting, I got my rifle license. Not an easy thing in the, in the UK. I got my first rifle. And then because I'm entrepreneurial, I was like, I want my own piece of land. I, I agree. So <laughs> I want one and, too. And, all land, and I couldn't afford to buy it, still can't. So yes. all land in Britain is private. Okay. Right? There is no public hunting land. Let, viewers need to understand mm. that. So I got a lead on a farm near my house where they had lots of road deer and munjack. And the farmer was like, please come and shoot deer. I'd love you to. So I gave him a little bit of money for, for it, like a thousand bucks a year or something. And thinking year one, I shot like 30 roe deer and 30 munjack on that place. And every one I put through my restaurant. And I was like, I'm onto something. And it's grown since then. With deer box coming into play, it's just gone big. So next year, I hope to have about 10 properties under management where we're controlling the numbers, totaling maybe... I want to say 50,000 acres, 60,000 acres. Big chunk. But we'll probably be having to shoot about 2,000 to two, 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 two to 2,200 wild deer, of which 1,800 will be fallow deer, uh, on those properties. Wow. So, and he has a, basically a syndicate, they would call it, yeah. of, okay. of uh, professional hunters that go mm -hmm. out and, call, team. Yep, and team. Call, call these animals. And you could talk about this, obviously, Mike, but they have a very regimented process uh, as you say, process. Sorry. Process. <laughs> yeah. from, from, it's called from, English for a reason. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> from field to table. So it, it's important how they take care of the animal once it hits the ground and yeah. get it into the chiller. So Okay. Yeah. We've, really interesting. I'm glad Neil raised that because we've learned a lot of stuff. Bear in mind, all the deer that we process, we're a fully government approved, what we call an APGHE, approved game handling establishment. It's the same as a um, USDA, USDA approved. Okay. Okay. Yep, okay. So every single, we have to follow a bunch of processes that are draconian. And every single deer carcass is inspected by a government veterinarian. Oh, wow. Looked into its file, its passport, basically, is looked at. It's compared to the data that we have in our books. And then it's stamped on every primal quarter, but with our own stamp number. I mean, and wow. what we have is internal policies on all the land, whereby we give all our hunters, when you kill a deer, there's a time from killing to bleeding, a time from bleeding to gutting, a time from gutting to getting into the chill. And then we take, we have, uh, we have, we have temperature sensors in all our chillers that run to our phones so that we can keep a constant log of temperatures so that we know that once that deer is down to temperature, until it's cut, frozen or sold, it never changes temperature. Any deer we buy, because we buy deer, we, in, we pay over the odds to our suppliers over market price, but we insist on top quality. Mm -hmm. And this is where shooting skills come in. Okay, yeah, because you can't just be spraying lead out there. You, we lose the shoulders. We lose a lot of money. Yeah, well, um, especially running, and, and I don't know anything about running a restaurant, but as I understand, 
those are pretty slim margins as it is. Too right. When sure. I recall the, the butchers, so the time they spend on an animal that's shot in the head or neck area versus an animal that's shot in the body. Like they've got to do all this yeah. trimming to get rid of yeah. the... And when you're doing hundreds, if not yeah. thousands of yeah. deer so they annually. they spend a lot of time on it. And, and obviously there's waste, so... And contamination. Yeah. And uh, one of the... One, and, and I know we're going to get into the technical element a bit yeah, later. Yeah, we will, yep. But one of the really key points for us is fragment-free ammunition. Oh, you got to have it. I can yeah. imagine so you're feeding it I mean, it it's a requirement public. for them, so... You every know, single like, deer is shot with... Right now, every single one of the deer that we harvest is shot with CX ammo. Beautiful stuff. And that bullet really kind of exactly the pill for, for what mm. you need it to do. Most of our deer are shot in the head and the neck. Mm -hmm. um, Understandably so. And at relatively short ranges mm -hmm. with excellent rests. And there's a lot I can talk about, about, about techniques and skills for mm -hmm. marksmanship. Yeah, we um, can definitely get into those. And, but really precision shooting and developing our hunter's shooting skills mm -hmm. is critical. I would imagine with your team of hunters and, and you included in that, if you have a land mass about the size of Wisconsin, like you mentioned, and however many 17 or 18 million people there. <clears throat> seven zero. Oh, 70 or 80 million. Mm. <laughs> uh, you, it, I mean, there are probably very few places where you could airmail something and not have, you know, a, a dwelling or something in There's that direction. There's nowhere. Exactly. South of Scotland. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I mean, our safety regimen is, we never, we have not, Knock touch wood. wood we have not had any issues we are we set these processes in place mm -hmm. there are rules absolutely um, you know and and our, our hunters are incredibly careful and on farm in the wild one of the things i get a lot of positive comments from is that we constantly mention there's 25 deer standing in front of me but i can't take a shot because they're on a skyline mm -hmm. or i can't take a shot because there's a hedge behind them now i don't know if a guy with a dog might be behind that hedge i can't use a hedge as a backstop so it's solid ground or nothing and yep. no overlapping deer the herd deer that that's hard <laughs> i mean this and a lot of it's taking place in the south of england so yeah. that's the most populated part of Here. that yeah. island right okay. yeah and um You'd see if you go over there, there's little hamlets and little villages and then maybe a house over here or something like this. So you might have a field or a wood or something like this where these animals are living, but on the other side could be a house and mm -hmm. they're, yeah, adamant about having a solid backstop, something yeah. above the animal, sure, which is obviously huge. And yeah. they've been using, as they call them, moderators, silencers sure. or suppressors yes. for a long time because again, they're in a pretty populated area yeah. and they don't want to be obnoxious. Noise pollution yeah. is a thing. Oh, not and... and Look, hearing protection. Uh, the reason the reason suppressors I call them moderators. The reason suppressors or silencers came into play in Britain was about thirty years ago. A lot of our forestry commission, the government body that owns a lot of land and have a has a very ruthless attitude towards deer. <laughs> um, they don't tolerate them very much. Uh, their professional deer colours, who they employ, were all using standard unsuppressed two seventies, and they were all going deaf or mm, tinnitus, of course. like yeah. all of them. You know. Shooting five, six hundred deer a year, they, they were all going deaf, mm. pure and simple. And you can't stalk through the woods on foot with, a, with, with plugs in. You just mm. can't do it. You, you can't get up to the deer. So they brought that. And if they bring them in for them, they can't deny it to us. So now when I apply for it, which is the, the irony is here in the States, if I was a citizen, I could walk into a store and buy a hunting rifle and probably walk out with it in most states, I'd yep. imagine. In the UK, to me to get a variation is three months minimum before I get. See, buying a rifle is like buying a suppressor here. Okay. But when I buy the rifle, I just I say with sound moderator, and the police just issue it. Interesting. No, well, no argument. Well, they, hopefully one day we'll get there. <laughs> yeah, that'd make be it, great. Yeah, it would make it fantastic because it is one of those things that just it's maximizes the experience for everybody involved, even those that don't want to be involved. You know, you want to be over there while I'm hunting over here. You don't have to hear it. Hornady Outfitter Ammunition is now loaded with Hornady CX bullets. Its optimized monolithic design combined with a heat shield tip offers extended range performance, enhanced accuracy, high weight retention, and deep penetration. Outfitter ammunition features corrosion-resistant nickel-plated cases that are sealed watertight, designed to perform under the toughest conditions. No matter where adventure takes you, trust your hunt to Outfitter Ammunition from Hornady. And then, and then the other thing they deal with over there that we don't, um, I mean, it's private property, but since everything is private, and you, you talk about the terminology used for it, but it's like a, a right to roam or something like this, <laughs> where people can just walk on people's properties. 
Yeah. So mm. because there is no, there's not a lot of public property, so they're allowed to go walking, take their dogs, do whatever they want. Uh, maybe you talk a little bit about that. That so, is so, interesting. So that's why you have to be very cautious because yeah. you don't know what's out there. So Major departure. Britain is completely crisscrossed by what we call footpaths, and footpaths are enshrined in law, and they often they're thousands of years old. Ways, you know, and you'll see a you'll see a field, and you'll see a two foot wide weed killed line straight through it to a gap in a hedge, and it's a footpath, and there's a wooden sign, and it's illegal right away. And of course, someone with the dogs, the dogs running around, the people are walking wherever they want, you know. So we assume there's a person behind every bush. Yeah, that's a good assumption. <laughs> you just go ahead with that. Right? I mean, it's about like hunting in, like if you would, some of the suburbs around uh, <laughs> yeah. Washington, D.C. or Atlanta or something sure, like that. Yeah, very densely populated. Yeah, where you... there's trees, there's lots of game, but there's houses around. And so you got to be very cognizant of what's going on. But we kill a lot of deer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there's lots of them. Yeah. And, and uh, so, I mean, we, we have real, as I say, really it comes down to skill and quality. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing like practice. It's like the military. It's like um, combat effectiveness. Training's one thing, but being in combat yeah, is a whole different yeah, ballgame. That amps up for, the training. For training you. And, and it's like that with us. We are, I mean, I personally still like to do it. Like, I'm busy. I make mm -hmm. TV shows. I've got restaurants. I go, yeah. But I still personally go stalk deer three days a week. That's amazing. Year round. For seven months. For seven months. That's remarkable. Um, I, I was out. I, I arrived here last night. I was out. The morning, but the day before, I was out all day. Shot four fallow deer. Um, probably shot fifteen that week, and then I'm back into on Friday and on Saturday and Sunday. I'll be out at dawn. <laughs> on now, it. How many restaurants uh, are you are providing meat for, and are they all yours? Or no, no, no. I own three. Okay. Or shares in three. Mm -hmm. um, we supply about thirty to forty. Wow. Um, on top of the the deer box. Yeah, that's part of deer box. Okay. It's our wholesale arm. Okay. So. And those deer are all sold and supplied to restaurants fresh. And we've got restaurants in, in Scotland, ironically, 500 miles away, but we post them, post the venison, you know, star. That's fantastic. And deer box is like a mail order, if you will, or yeah. you know, internet-based business like, where you want you could, chops, you want this, yeah, you like want that, and we'll Cisco ship you. Cisco here in America it's, or yeah. something. artisan wild venison delivered to your door. Okay. Now, I'd like to take this <laughs> rabbit hole down just a little bit, uh, not get too far into the weeds, but I got to know... You know, each animal here in North America, an antelope, a white-tailed deer, and an elk, they're very similar. You can prepare them in the same way, largely, but they all have a unique taste. Oh, yeah. And so, in the deer in England, one, are there some that are a little bit more tricky than others? And two, what are some of your, I just, again, <laughs> I don't want to derail this, but what are some go-to recipes that you do with venison? Yeah. Because in North America and largely our entire listening base, when they're shooting an animal, I mean, that's... It's part of the thing. You bring it home and everybody's excited yeah, about it. But I feel like a lot of a lot of deer meat, you know, the North American white tailed deer, I think a lot of it just gets breaded and fried in a skillet. But now hold on. I got I gotta I gotta <laughs> I gotta prep this for him. So uh. I stayed at his house one time. Well, I stayed at his house a few times, but it's like, Neil, would you like some breakfast? Yeah, that'd be great, Mike. Thanks so much. So, you know, it kinda opens the fridge and I can kinda see what's in there. It's like eggs and this like a couple things turn my back, come back, and poof, it's a gourmet breakfast. So Mike's a little more skilled than most people, right. okay? Well, that's what like, I was... Like, I'd have made, like, scrambled eggs or something. No, it's like, you know, eggs Very Benedict ornate. and all sorts of stuff. So, yeah, there's there's a little more going on with Mike than there is with uh, most of us. Sure, understood. Well, are, are there some go-to recipes for each of your deer species, like, hundred... say, in your restaurant that you use? But what I'd love to do is just start, start a little, just a tiny bit further back. Go ahead. There's... Two things, this sometimes gets me in trouble with my, our American viewers of the show, ask me a lot of questions about this. The thing that I, a lot of, a lot of my American view, viewers and, and now friends, I've become quite good friends with a lot of people who watch the show, um, say to me is, right, my deer's gamey, first mm. thing, or my deer's strong, or it tastes the bloody, or whatever. I'm like, okay, things we have learned doing tens of thousands of carcasses and supplying them to multi-Michelin star chefs who have no tolerance for lack of consistency right. they are ruthless they are hard some of them are pretty unpleasant at times when when they need to be so they just go send it back understood so what do we do to guarantee consistency and this is the one thing this is the two things that your your viewers could do that will radically change it the first is if you're not if you're not the vast i believe vast majority of deer still shot are probably does or non-trophy animals right, right? yep so if, let's just take trophy deer out of it for the moment. Okay. I'm talking about caping and yeah. present. 
Two things. One, bleed your deer. If you've killed a deer with a rifle or a bow and you see it lying dead, right, don't wait two hours to go to it. Go to it and bleed it. Now, bleeding means putting a knife in the notch in the throat, right, wiggling it deeply and then unzipping the side of the throat up okay. to the chin past the Adam's apple. So you're not cutting the esophagus. You're going up the side of it. Now, what happened? And then I put the deer on a downwards angle. There's always some form of downwards angle. Get a log, put its back end on it. Okay, simple. While there's pressure in the deer's system, even if you've heart shot it, right? What will happen then is it will exsanguinate. It will pump blood because it's a pressurized system. And the blood will not pool in the muscles of the deer. If the blood pools in the muscles of the deer, within half an hour it's pooled. You can't then get it out. If the blood pools in the muscles of the deer, it will taste irony because blood has hemoglobin. It tastes some iron. It's... It's, you get a darker, redder, stronger meat. Interesting. This is just scientific fact, honestly. Yeah. And it's not something people in the States do by now. Uh, uh, of course. I would say I've never done it. It's the number one thing you can do to improve your venison by a mile. You've okay. seen me do it but a hundred times. It's not just, you know, like in the old days, people might cut the throat mm-hmm. or something yeah, like no, that. This no, is... it's right in here, right okay. through, right by the, uh, the clavicle. Yes. So right in here. And... So, so lift one, stand to the, okay, I'll tell you how to do it, right? Deer's, on, deer's lying on its side, right? Don't care which side, dead. Right, you walk up, you go around the back of its head, the back side of it, you lean over, you lift the front leg up, and while it's lying on its side, you put the knife in parallel with the backbone, straight down. I use a, one of my own design knives, about three and a half inch blade, in, wiggle, 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 wiggle. You cut the aorta and the essential blood vessels direct to the heart and unzip it up the side of the esophagus, the trachea, okay. so you do not rupture the esophagus with all that green goo in it, mm-hmm. right? Done. And then what I do is I, and I reach in my hand and I pull the whole esophagus and, tri- esophagus and trachea out and I just cut behind it and flop it out of the deer. So it's Any green goo where... going on the ground. Yep. Right. You've seen me do this yep. dozens of times. It takes two seconds. Then just have a chat, have a cup of tea, forget about it, wait 10 minutes, then gralic your deer. Sorry, gut your deer. Yeah. Uh, Gralic's a Scottish word. It means okay. to disembowel an Englishman, as far as I can tell. <laughs> and, um, Coming from the Englishman. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, you know. Um, so it was a sword cut. Gralic. You know. So then you gralic your deer. And then what I tend to do, if I'm carrying on hunting, I hang it from a tree by its two back legs. Yes. Not, not head up, bottom down. Head down. Like right. you want everything to run downhill and out. Yep. Understood. You don't want any blood pooling in the biggest muscles, which is the hams and the haunches. Mm-hmm. I can't even tell you how this will change the quality of your meat. That is a great takeaway. And if the listener takes nothing else away from that, or from this conversation, that, that's a good piece right there. If you go to my YouTube channel, mm-hmm. right, which I've just which restarted. Is, okay, what is that? Um, Mike Robinson, Chef. Okay. Um, I am doing two weekly films, and all of them involve an educational element. So all of Farming the Wild does this as well. Mm. Uh, Instagram to a degree, but we know they're a bit sensitive. Yeah. So, but this is something we do all the time. Uh, if you've got no trees, you growl like the deer lying on its back. If you've got a tree, it's suspended. This is what we all our, all our hunters do, and this gives us the quality product that we get. The consistency that you're not dealing with so, upset chefs. So, so let's assume we then do that going forward. Okay. Answering your original question. We have six species of deer in the UK. From largest to smallest, we have red deer. You call them red stag, but red stag is just the male. Mm-hmm. We have red deer. Uh, we have fallow deer. We have sika deer, Japanese sika deer that you have in Maryland. Mm-hmm. We then have roe deer. Then we have muntjac and Chinese water deer. Chinese water deer and muntjac, tiny little things. Uh, with the uh, fangs. With yeah. the fangs, yeah. I was going to say that. Chinese water deer have got like, like vampire teddy bears. They've yeah. got like, you know. And then a muntjac has, has large canines but has antlers. Antlers as well. Okay. And they're angry little devils. Are they but really? But they take a shot. They're, they're hard little creatures and they're hard to kill. They never stop moving. Chinese water deer, again, characteristic. They live in the middle of massive arable fields. They look like hares or rabbits. And they only have two modes of operation. Flat out run or lie down. They never stop and stand. That could make for a challenging hunt. Like you mentioned at the beginning of the recording that these aren't just pen raised. This is oh, no. actual hunting. Oh, yeah. And if you hit a Chinese water deer with a 6.5 PLC in the ribs, you've lost most of the deer. Okay, yeah. so you yeah. got to be very precise. Yeah, which we'll get Same into. Same with a muntjac, because a muntjac's... Little, Very small. Little guy, yeah. mm-hmm. And the hydrostatic shock of the bullet going anywhere in the front end of that deer, because chest cavity is that big, ruptures the diaphragm, and then the liver goes, and then everything else. And you get a you get deer soup inside it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, it's quite good to be able to neck them. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And then, the, and then talk about how you get them, like, you know, you kind of have a time limit and you try to get them to the... So, so now bear in mind in Britain, uh, probably as is the case in most of like the Midwest, and it, a lot of this does kind of exclude a little bit Western mountain hunting because it's a different thing. Sure. Mm. You can't exactly hoik an elk up in a tree and gut right. it, right? <laughs> right. I get that 100%. I'm realistic. But whitetail and fallow are really similar in sizes. Okay. Until you get up to the far north where they like horses, mm. you know what I mean? But the bottom line is, I can gener- I carry um, a short piece of rope, uh, a pulley, and a foldable gambrel leg spreader, and I just throw that over a tree in my little belt kit, and I pull the thing up on a pulley, and all I need to do is get the deer's back legs off the ground, right? Once they're off the ground, I then have gravity working, I tunnel out its anus, and then I've already done the throat, and then... <laughs> the rest all- just comes out pretty easy. Saw the chest, mm-hmm. it's all out. If I've got to extract it through some horrible stuff, I don't want contamination, I will just take the red pluck out. Sorry, the green pluck out, mm. like the Scots The intestines too. and things. Mm-hmm. The intestines, I'll leave the diaphragm the blood, north. Bur- the blood-bearing organs stay. Right. And then I'll leave, I've already bled it, mind you, but then that means dragging it out through undergrowth and stuff, the leaves and stuff aren't going in the carcass. Ah, understood. Um, but don't, don't throw your deer in a truck and take it home to, gr- to gut it. You've got to gut things on the spot. I, I would say, when people say doesn't matter i go okay you like you eat beef you eat pork you eat lamb what do you think they do in an abattoir do you think they kill it and then go and have lunch and then come back and gut it right Mm -hmm. no they kill it within 10 seconds it's hung up it's bled and it's out Mm -hmm. so why is it any different with deer it isn't it isn't absolutely (laughs) And, and you have to put it into terms like that because what you have in the states in france in germany is you have historical teaching you have you have, I don't want to say father and son, it's a bit patriarchal, but you have families teaching generations in their way of doing it. Mm-hmm. And, and it's accepted that those ways are correct. Now, I'm only here to tell people what works for us. Right, sure. It works well, for you, keep doing you've it. You've got tens of thousands of uh, animals We have that behind us, right. but I wouldn't dream of telling people how to do things. Understood. All I'm trying to say here is how we do it and how well it works. Mm-hmm. And that's important. Yeah, a lot to take away. Because I don't want to come across a prat who's telling people how to do it, but, yeah. you know, it's... We do a lot. <laughs> Understood. And uh, believe me, if, if, if our deer are not consistent right through the year, we get it. We, you, we hear, you about, hear it. about it. Hornady Security Mobilis Safes. Discover the ultimate solution for safeguarding your valuable equipment with Hornady Security Mobilis Safes. Offering an innovative modular design, Mobilis Safes can be easily transported and assembled piece by piece in any room. Featuring a full square lock interior organizing system that maximizes storage space with countless storage configurations. Elevate your security with Mobilis Safes from Hornady Security. Well, I want to hear about the dishes. What are you, what are you preparing or how are you preparing these, the, this venison? It's probably quite a big difference is the way we prepare it is that uh, I look at the deer like I'd look at a lamb. Mm. So, for a exa- good example. So most of my friends, and, and I, I've, I've spent so much time, I love, America's like my second home. I spend a lot of time here with, I have amazing friends. And I go over every year and help cull deer in Rhode Island with my buddy, Jim Manny, and, which I invited you to do this year, and you're going to come and do next year. And which is, there's a, and, and I'm trying to, I'm getting them into this habit. But um, what we do is we look at it and I go, okay, so what, how can I maximize what comes out of this deer? And you don't need fancy equipment. You need a bone saw and a knife. And the key is, I like cooking meat on the bone. Okay. So what I don't do is backstrap and grind, right? It's such a waste just pulling the backstrap out of a deer. I mean, instead of cooking a a fillet of elk, why not cook a tomahawk steak of elk? That's what I'm saying. Right? So what's the difference? There's presentation there. Well, and flavor. You cook meat on the bone, it keeps the juice. Chew that bone. I'm mouth-watering thinking about it. Yeah. Same with, the. then you go further down the saddle from the tomahawks or the long bone chops and you get into the t-bones and okay they're not beef-sized t-bones they're but amazing they're, yeah you slow cook one of those puppies on a traeger having marinated it at like a hundred no 250 degrees for like 40 minutes and then you sear it in a hot pan oh, with foaming yeah. butter yeah. and garlic what time is it right now yeah oh, <laughs> lunch time yeah, yeah. and then <laughs> the real big one for us is a di- is a cut called a pave oh yeah okay. oh yeah. god he's heard this so many times so so the pave is a French word, meaning it's a paving slab, a cobblestone. A cobblestone is a lump of stone, a rounded lump of stone, like Paris. You know, it's just pave is, mm-hmm. is what they call paving. 
most paving is flat slabs. On the continent, it tends to be rounded stones. And they ha- I got this 25 years ago when I used to cook in France in restaurants. I trained there. Um, and I speak a bit of French. Classic brasserie cuts of pavé de rump steak. Now, the French will take a rump of beef. A rump of beef is made up of four different muscles. Uh, the haunch. And they will seam out each one of those muscles individually. Unlike Britain, where we cut straight across all of them, mm. traditionally. And they will treat each muscle separately, and they will take a two-inch thick steak off the single muscle. And then they will roast it like a little joint of beef. So carefully roast it. Now, the best way to do that at home is to season it, is to put it on a tray, or in it. ideally, I mean, I love Traegers because they're a game changer for cooking game, to be for honest. Sure. So I would ideally, an oven or a Traeger at super low. We're talking 100 Celsius, 220 Fahrenheit. For, uh, uh, an eight, eight ounce venison pave, mm-hmm. season it lightly, put it on a tray, a little bit of oil, put it in there, 15 minutes, 20 minutes tops at 100. You'll, look, you'll open it and go, nothing's happened, but it will. Because the protein, protein denatures or changes from raw to cooked state at 60 degrees Celsius or thereabouts. Okay. Double it and add 30, 150 yeah. Fahrenheit, right? So you're doing that at about 200, you're nudging it up to change. What's happened is throughout that meat, the structure's changed and you get an even pink cook all the way through. Pink, but cooked, right? Remember, pink isn't blood. It's the color of the muscle. Okay. People think a pink steak is full of blood. It, yeah. it isn't. There's some in there, but there isn't. You then take it out and you then get your skillet red hot and you throw in a massive lump of butter, mm. crush some rosemary, crush some garlic cloves like you've seen on Instagram, people doing the steak, and you foam that puppy until it goes crusty and golden serve it and it will be com- from corner to corner and the big tip i'll give you the big tip i'll Sounded give you really good yeah. right now the big tip i'm going to give you is you carve your meat across the grain of course most people don't they just yeah. pick it up and cut it oh sure look at the grain in the pave cut across it yep so the mouth feels just a lot that's better. what's made me my living for 25 years yeah. that, so steak. the pave we would know is what part of the Part of the ham. Uh, Part of the ham, okay. Individual semal primal muscles out of the ham of the day. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Top and bottom round. And yeah, so I, I've, got, I, I've got a little, um, I've actually got a cool little reel about making jerky, um, which I did just last two days ago. And uh, I, I do like a speed it up. I'll show you how to do it. And I've got numerous ones. Outdoor channel, if you go on MOTV, mm-hmm. there's two specials on at the moment where I break down whole deer. Uh, and I do the entire. I did it for Outdoor Channel, so you've got all access to all this, all your viewers. Mm-hmm. MOTV, go on there, farming the wild, and look up butchery and gutting special, field dressing specials, two half hour specials that do this whole process I've just described, yeah. start to finish. That sounds amazing. And any time you get to watch a true professional that has that much experience doing that one job. It, they, I'm sure you make it look like, oh, it's just this easy. But it's- <laughs> we, we got some experience in October. No, when did we come over there? Last year, about a year ago now. <laughs> mm-hmm. So we did, a, we did a hunt for uh, a bunch of fallow deers, again, to supply their, their market. Yeah. Just culling. Um, but yeah, it's all fun and games. So you got to do about 20 a, deer in a row. That's and, a lot uh, of work. And being so you got to deleg them. Mm-hmm. And there's an interesting process there too. They got little bumps on their leg. You feel yeah. for the oh, yeah. third bump, second bump, oh. slice it off. Take yeah, their ears and head off. I love that you said that because one of my, I had an interesting experience. I, I have this, I go to my great buddy in Rhode Island. And it's a, it's a guy I want to, sh- I'll shout out, Jim Manny, this amazing dude in Rhode Island. You're going to meet him next year. Jim's an awesome guy. He was colonel of the Rhode Island State Police. Okay. He's an absolute gentleman. He's a pillar of the community. He's uh, decorated. He was uh, on, he was in the secret, I don't want to give away too much. He was in the U.S. Secret Service. Okay. He was protection detail for presidents, oh. our queen. The guy's a legend, right? Uh, yeah, sounds like it. Jim, he's now retired from that. Um, but w- there is an island off Rhode Island called Block Island. It's like Amity in Jaws. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. you know, literally. Yeah. Yeah. In the summer, it's 12 miles offshore. It's eight miles by six. Like Half a million people go, and it's just drunkenness of this. Yeah. It's crazy. But 50 years ago, some people brought a dozen white tail there okay. and let them go, right? There's no coyotes. There's no bobcats. There's, there's no absolutely predator. nothing, right? So these are, and then there's lots of millionaires, five and 10 acre plots. Yeah. The whole island's covered in them and a few farms. Scrub, rocks in the Atlantic. And about 20 years ago, when Jim was bigger than police there, 
the, the deer are in really bad shape. Just what, a classic example. Block islands like Britain on a yeah, tiny scale. It's in scale. its own little biosphere, you know. Yeah. Okay. These deer were these deer were getting tumors. They were getting small. They were getting diseases. There were there were thousands of them on a six point five five mile island. That's a problem. So Jim, being an utter utter legend, said, "Okay, I'm going to fix this." So he spoke to the Department of Environmental Management in Rhode Island, and he said, "Here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to manage these deer." So he set up a program to help the locals manage the deer. So some of the cool local guys, my mate Kirk Littlefield, a few other guys. They're really good at this now. They're doing similar numbers to us in England. Oh, wow. And, but they do it with a shotgun. With, you've oh, keep, slugs, I, yeah. I keep begging you for them every year yeah. because... 20 gauge slugs. 20 gauge Sabo slugs. Yeah. I've never... Amazing. And muzzle loaders, flintlocks, we use it all. Anyway, um, I went over there this October and you know, we, did, we did 30 deer in a day and a half. And um, it's, it's a lot of work. You know? yeah, yeah, it is a lot of work. That's when the work starts. But here's the cool thing. So he set up a program... And uh, there's a, in Providence, Rhode Island, there's a large communities of Hmong communities, Cambodian communities who came over after the Vietnam conflict and settled and they were you know, helped over here. And they're just lovely, lovely people. And there's some cool people there. There's a center for Southeast Asians there. And they really value this, this, this protein, right? So, Absolutely. And they, they have these family structures where this is a huge deal. So what they do is they donate every one of these deer to those communities. Okay. And they're on a rotor system, and one year they'll get one, three years later they'll get one. And so we, 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 we do the full process. We leave them in the skin, but fully processed, mm -hmm. tagged. Everyone has an official redem tag on it. it pro it's beautifully done. And then they go over on the ferry in big containers, and they're waiting on the other side, and they all go off, and they get consumed. Oh, that's fantastic. Such a cool story. Yeah. Right? I mean, I got to, so when we were in, in the UK, that was another thing to cover, is is so that the, the deer gets shot, it gets growlicked, gutted, yep. uh, bled, obviously, and then it's transported to the chiller. They, a larder is what they call mm -hmm. it. This is their uh, what uh, processing location. And then what do you do? So you hang it, so skin on. Hang it, skin on. Now again, get a lot of response on this. Yeah, especially from the Western hunter, because a lot of people aren't aren't taking whole well, dude, animals I, out. I, of course. And that, listen, again, I've said, make yeah. really clear about this. You've got to do what you got to do. Yeah. You've got to do what you've got to yeah. do, right? I've done that in Scotland. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you've got to do what you've got to do. But I'm talking about... If you can have your druthers. If you can get to the deer or you've got... You can get the deer to a vehicle. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking about. Forget everything else. Yep. And because I've seen a lot of West Hunters, they're absolutely awesome. They, they get the deer. The thing is, what they do in the West, of course, is they get that deer done straight away. So yes, they do. They get the heat out of it. They're, yeah. they're really good at that. But I'm talking about everywhere else <laughs> right. with white tail, with the however many million white tail deer are harvested in this yeah. year every year. So what we do, as Neil was saying, is, is, is the deer get they they go to the larder within a period of time. There we we give them a primary inspection. We if they need a quick clean out, we wash them out with water that we've had tested. So that there's nothing bad in the water. I mean, we go to those levels. Mm, yeah. All our larders have water tested. Wow. Remains, so there's no bacteria or E. coli or anything in the water. We like the deer to be dry. So if we're headshot deer and we do what I said quickly enough, you'll see that deer is white and clean on the inside with no washing needed. If we have to wash it out, we wash it out very quickly and then we wipe it out with clean towel. So that, because if it's too damp in a chiller environment, you get mold growing. Mm. So, but leave the skin on if you have a chiller. And the reason for that is the deer grew up in it. It's not unhygienic. Okay. It, it's, it's, it's sterile, right? right. Nothing's gone in there. Like, it's, it, the deer lived in it, so it can't be bad for it. Um, so, we love that. And that's an interesting point. Like, I mean, people say, oh, it's unhygienic. No, it isn't. It, it isn't. But make sure everything's clean. Hang the deer in the fur. Because if you strip the fur off the deer and then you give it seven days in the chiller... This, that meat goes dark and black and you've does, lost, you you've lost the whole outer yeah. pedicle. Yeah. If you hang it with the fur on, you don't lose anything. Oh, man. That yeah. makes sense. <laughs> it's a bit harder to skin, but if you're good, who cares? Right. Yeah, but their skinning, their skinning process is pretty interesting, <laughs> too. It's the whole winch deal. And they, oh, sure. Yeah. But, but it's you leave it in there for seven days. Seven days in the fur or thereabouts. The fur, yeah. And then skinned, inspected, and then two to three days out of the fur in a clean room. So we have an in-fur room. We have a skinning room. We have and a it clean room. We have area. a butchery room. It's a factory process. Yeah. Wow. And there's a, there's a guy in there that, you know, they come out, fur on, put in through this kind of mechanical process. Mm -hmm. Fur comes off. 
and then boom, straight into the other chiller where it ages a little bit more, and then out of there and straight to the straight to the guys yeah. that are cutting them up. That's just fantastic, doing fantastic stuff and on such a large scale. I mm. mean, those those numbers mean something. So I'd like to uh, shift gears just a little bit now and get a little bit more on the technical side. You talked about uh, you know some shooting stuff that where you can't afford to miss, you can't afford the meat damage, and you can't afford lead fragments in your meat uh, that you're obviously selling. So let's switch gears. We can start talking about the, the shooting aspect, maybe how you guys go about shot selection and some of the practice things and, you know, shooting positions you guys use and we'll talk about what products you're using as well. So let's focus on fallow deer because that's our mainstay. Yep. And we, we'll talk a bit about the other deer because every deer behaves differently. All six species, they have totally different behavioral patterns. That's the other thing. Um, so equipment. Right, the basic equipment that it lives in my Land Rover is first and foremost shooting sticks. Got to right? have them. We do not take unsupported shots. We don't take shots off tree branches, off backpacks, it, it, because we can't get the level of precision we require. Yeah. And it's a it's a forested area typically, so you're you're in the woods, so you're going to be standing. You can't really okay. get prone. Can't like get down and lean on a tree. It, you come around a corner and there's a gang of fallow deer. You can't say to the fallow deer, "Hang on while I get to a tree." you most certainly cannot take a freehand shot, right? A lot of people think, I'm great freehand, I can kill free. I, I defy anyone at 120 yards to put a, to put a bullet into a bottle cap right. freehand. And that's what we're trying to do. So we use a type of stick. and there's a, The brand I use is Viperflex. Okay. Klaus, my mate, is a Danish dude. He's come up with this system. You've used yeah, them. Yeah, I've like, used them. I've taken them to Africa. They're great. There's nothing like have them. Have you used there? them? I have not. No. To okay. change, change your life. Really? Yeah, for, for, for shooting <laughs> standing, it's the, way, it's to the go. way to go. So I've even adapted mine a little. I put a little bit of foam on them, and I, I do a bit of playing around for what I do. But essentially, they're what we call a quad stick. Yeah. So the rear of the butt is supported and the front is oh, supported. Oh, fantastic. But there's no, but it's just unfolds. I can, I can go from holding them in my left hand collapsed to killing a deer in four or five seconds. Oh, well, quick and deployment and stable. If you, put the, if you stable. put the rifle on the front, you can move it slightly left and right with your, with mm. your hand. But it just kind of rocks back and forth till you get elevation correct. And you can actually lean the back leg up against your chest. So it gets it's really, really stable. stable. And that was the Viking stick? Viper Flex. Viper Flex. Okay. And I even now use a fifth leg on it. And a I, longer range shot. And I'll pull that out and anchor it. And it's, it, you're on a four foot high bipod. That's yeah. fantastic. With and a bench rest behind your I was going to say, with, with <laughs> yeah, super stable. forward and aft support. So that allows me now to reach out to 200 odd yards with. And I, you, I, we, so practice. <clears throat> so I, I, I've had hard ox steel gongs made for all our guys. And these are in the shape of a fallow doe's head and neck looking oh, at yeah. me with ears, life size. And my rule is you've got to be able off sticks to put three bullets in the center of that forehead at a hundred yards or you don't shoot in our land. Pretty stringent. But yeah, I suppose in, in that the in the area, <laughs> yeah, there, there it is. <laughs> Pass it, it or don't. Well, it works, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you must practice. I, I fire, I probably shoot about 2,000 rounds a year and I kill, uh, if, if I'm having a big year, I might shoot 500 deer. And so I'm probably shooting practice. I'm shooting three to one, you know? Wow. And um, That's a lot of trigger pulling for hunting. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of people that'll go their lifetime as a hunter and shoot 500 animals total. Yeah. Oh yeah. That, that's the thing. I mean, the, the, the English or the guys that are hunting in the UK shoot a lot more animals. I Absolutely. mean, it's just, you know, like in the States, I don't know what the average would be. One, one and a half, two deer per, per hunter, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, depends. But over there, the, the guy that is hunting is shooting a lot, but also because they have to. Sure. You know, there, there's two types of hunters in Britain and, and both are valuable. There's the recreational hunter who just loves it. Right who is a member of our syndicate, who's done the training course, the, the level one and two deer stalking certificate. He's done his large meat hygiene course, which allows him to put the meat into the food chain, all those things. That person's super keen, helps fund the, this program. Mm -hmm. We charge them a modest amount annually. Make you guys cry, to be honest with you, for the access they get for it. Um, and they then can shoot un unlimited amounts of deer for that. And we're, we're delighted if they shoot a lot of deer. Sure. And um, as long as they shoot the right deer. So we're very stringent on what gets harvested. So with fallow deer, we're looking at trying to focus from November to the end of March, which is our female season, five months. We're looking for, um, for them to try and shoot large, mature female fallow, do fallow female does. Mm -hmm. 
uh, not followers particularly. We'd like, rather they grew onto their maximum weight. We want them to shoot the mature does. And uh, generally, if they can, shoot them in the head of the neck. Mm. I'm not averse to a body shot because we have to control deer. Some of the land we shoot on is very large open fields and requires body shooting. Mm -hmm. Body shooting accurately is harder than head shooting. Really? Because the area you have to not get blood splash behind the shoulder blade, mm. to not damage the shoulders, you have to look. When you're taking a, a body shot with a, with a butcher and a... And oh. a venison seller's mindset. Yeah. An entirely different <laughs> yeah. perspective. <laughs> yeah. I cannot shoot a deer through the shoulders. Can't bring myself to do it. So you just can't do it. So I am looking for one and a half to two inches behind the crease of the shoulder blade. But I will only shoot if I can see one front leg. So it's perfectly broadside. If yeah. I see two, I'm not taking the shot. Because mm. I'll either put the deer through the front blade or the back blade. And one of my signature dishes in my restaurant is uh, a slow braised glazed shoulder of deer. I can't do that with a big ragged hole through it. No, you cannot. So yeah, that's a little tough. <laughs> yeah. And again, the guys that are doing the butchering, it takes them a lot more time because yeah. they got to trim all that Clean stuff all that off. Up. So. Okay. So, so body shooting accurately is harder than head. The great thing about neck and head shooting is I only take a head shot if the deer is looking straight at me or straight away from me. I never take a side on shot because mm. there's a chance of taking the jaw. Yep. Uh, but a frontal head shot, here's the deal. If you misjudge the range and you've got your range fighting milk, this is 150 yards. You've got your sticks, you've got your fifth leg, it's looking right at me like that, glaring at me, right? And I've shouted at it generally, all right, and the deer's like that. Yeah. Put the crosshair here. Let's just say it's actually on a bump of ground 50, 80 meters further on, and I squeeze the trigger. Well, if it's straight in that plane here, the bullet's just going to go and hit him here. So it's still lethal. Dead, dead, yeah, right? yeah, still lethal. utterly lethal with a correct caliber round. One of the reasons I adore the CX round is that it will penetrate no matter what. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you get full penetration. 100%. Every time. Yeah. Every single time. It's the best thing ever. So my, my targets are either the back of the head in a group, the front of the head, or the Adam's apple. Right? If it's the shoulder, as I say, it's... It's, it's a little more try difficult. Try and do two inches behind. You know if you look at a shoulder blade on a deer... You can't see it per se, but there is a, f a notch in the top of the shoulder blade. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You, you want to continue that notch into a saucer and put the bullet in the middle of it. So it's back of the front leg, back an inch, halfway up the body is the money zone. Yeah. And you got to do it pretty quickly. Pretty <laughs> quickly. <laughs> so yeah. if I'm looking at a group of deer, I'm going from side to side. I'm looking at them and I'm going, no, 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 no. You'll do. Boom. And it's as soon as I decide, fast. round's gone. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, so in, in doing all of that, that hunting, and it, it is legitimate hunting, it is. do you have a go-to cartridge or a go-to caliber and, and a few cartridges within that caliber that really work for you? Because shooting animals inside of 300 yards, that's like the, that's bread and butter in America. That's like a lot of, yeah. almost all the hunting happens at those ranges. Same in England. I, okay. I, all my, yeah, I was saying, yeah, I had a very frustrating day two days ago. And uh, the deer were running rings around me, as they do quite often. And I saw, I saw a couple of hundred yeah, deer. Yeah, big herds. So they'll yeah. just, you know, They see you. Disappear. The fields are, well, you've seen them, like yeah. a thousand yards across and they're in the middle of it. And I'm not launching bullets at five, six hundred yards. Because yeah. with a breath of wind, you might hit it in the back end. I just, I just walk away and find a better group. Right. But these deer finally got up on some. And they still figured it out. Even though they couldn't smell me, they couldn't see me. But they just use. Yeah, they've got a sixth <laughs> sense. They ran up and stood in the edge of the wood, and it was 410 yards. I was like, I know, I'm using that Vortex razor scope, and it's mm. got, it's got uh, an eye of zero to 100, and it's set first line down is exactly 200, second line is exactly 250, third line is 300, and the fourth line says four on it. So I was like, That's four. So I put four in that notch, one off, two, bang, bang, two deer, both hit within. Bottle cap at that range. Fantastic. So that was a 6.5 PRC, 130 grain outfitter. Oh, yeah, the CX. CX. Mm -hmm. yeah. So my two go-to rounds are 6.5 Creedmoor, 120 grain CX outfitter, and what I just said. The 6.5 yeah. PRC, and the 6.5, plenty of, of bullet diameter to get oh. the job done, plenty about, of velocity. It's about ideal for the British Isles, especially because mm -hmm. like, you, you got all you need to shoot a stag. Yeah. Oh, right. Plenty sure. for a stag. I watched, I, I hunted with Jason... In Scotland, we went and had a lovely day on the hill together, and he yeah, shot- Yeah, Jason got stuck in. He got yeah. stuck in. He shot, he shot two stags. Two stags that day and one the day before, yeah. so- And they were awesome hunts in 
m- ridiculous wind. Yeah, I mean, unbelievable wind. <laughs> like yeah. Nebraska 50, wind, no, Wyoming 50, wind. 50 miles an hour. 50 oh, wow, to 60 yeah, like, miles an hour on an yeah. open Scottish hillside. Like legitimate Great Plains type of wind. Crazy but, yeah. wind, yeah. And we stalked around onto this bluff, and the second the second deer was 225 yards. I filmed it. I've got it on video. Yeah. 225 yards with my rifle, with my my Savage, with uh, with with a this that 130 grain. And this stag in full rut, angry, full of testosterone, like, yeah. like they, you know, running yeah, they around. Were, they were running big time. Giving awesome. it, giving it all this, you know. Yeah. And if ever a deer is going to run with a shot, this is it. Oh, hundred okay, so, percent. But with a big suppressor on, the shot was like <laughs> with the PRC. Yeah. And and all the wind, so they can't hear yeah. it. And yeah. we'd managed to get round, so the wind was straight at us, so there wasn't much bullet deviation. Two hundred twenty yards. Deer went woof. Didn't like that. Went. I'd say 28 yards, dead on the stone, dead as a stone. Wow. And immaculate, perfect bullet yeah. placement. And that's a big rutted up stag. Yeah. Yeah. So the 6.5 PRC, obviously the high velocity works. Um, I'm curious to hear, when did you make the transition from, you know, maybe what other bullets you'd been using to the CX? Because, I mean, the SST is a great bullet, the interlock, well, dude, but the CX is... I was using the GMX for the last sure. five years. Okay. So you're <laughs> so, still staying monolithic. Yeah. But pre, pre that... I, I used the um, SSTs. The SSTs, yeah. I mean, I, like everyone else, I used SSTs. Yeah. They're amazing. It's a good bullet. It's accurate. still super popular uh, in the UK. Mm-hmm. Got to tell you, it's an amazing round. Like, yeah. and it kills deer. Like, it's it's deathly accurate. It's particularly for head and neck shooting. It's a fantastic round. But because we made this commitment for you know, no metal in the carcass, it's we, an we, easy decision. It, it, and the CX, the CX performs marginally better than the GMX did. I'll tell you that. Yeah, it certainly does. Um, in every level, I mean, I've shot, I've shot a couple of two hundred and twenty deer with it since I moved over to it. Okay. And it's uh, it's it, not one's got away. No, and they they do even if it's a if it's a GMX and a CX where they're nearly identical, but we just put the heat shield tip and we change the groove geometry. Those bullets launch at the same velocity. The CX at every range, as close as 50 yards, will simply impact with more velocity yeah. than the GMX predecessor. And velocity ha- plays a big role with monolithic bullet performance. It does. I mean, I, you, I tell you, I, I filmed some recently. And the great thing about using these big suppressors that we use, and, and interesting, suppressor technology in the U.S. Is, has come directly from the military. And you can see that because all suppressors in the U.S. screw onto the end of your barrels. Whereas all suppressors in Europe oversleeve over the barrels. Mm. And it, two completely different mindsets. I like oversleeve because, of course, from a weight and balance point of view, balance is everything in rifles. It can be. It doesn't overbalance the rifle. So I love overbalance. And I have oversized. I, I, my moderators look ridiculous. Yeah, it's like a scotch, <laughs> like, a, like the shipper that a scotch bottle comes yeah, in. Yeah, <laughs> it's, like, it's like that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't Definitely care what they quiet. look like. Oh, yeah. it's a Creedmoor in open ground. Yeah, sounds like a pellet gun. And and recoils like a twenty two long rifle. Yeah. Beautiful and thing. And so I can I watch here's the number one thing you see. I, I find that uh, CX rounds in both calibers. Like if you if you put the one thirty CX outfitter against the one forty three ELDX in PRC in a six five mm. PRC, um the uh the one thirty is a softer round to shoot. Okay. Um noticeably. One of the things it's really important to me, and both perform brilliantly, but one of the things that's really important to me is I need to see the bullet hit the deer. Yes. Okay. I think one of the biggest problems with people losing deer is that they lose sight of the yeah. shot picture and then the deer... Yeah. I think I hit it. I don't know where. Yeah. But if you can watch it. If that you impact. can watch it. Yeah, that's... I have a double bubble on that one because I have... I can see the deer hit, so I can... And I can hear the deer hit. The, the hearing, if you've shot enough deer, it tells you exactly where you hit that deer. Sure. Right, it, it really does. And the does. CX is a very audible bullet. Cool. If you're shooting suppressed, oh, he had a video you're showing us earlier. Yeah, yeah. same thing. It very yeah. much is the first animal that I was around for the CX. Uh, Preston, the guy behind the camera yeah. here, shot an antelope at exactly 300 yards with a 6.5 PRC, and I was not expecting that sound, and it caught wow. me off guard. Where I was yeah. like, I've heard a lot of bullets hit animals, and that didn't sound like anyone I've ever heard before. Yeah. It sounded wet almost. Uh, it was definitely an yeah. audible difference going from. You know the traditional lead core bullets that I've been shooting, or or even the GMX to the CX. It's the go-to, really. I think it's the go-to in Britain now, really. Yeah. Um, Do you have your whole team shooting the yep. CX? Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, we've had n- zero problems, right? Z- particularly with American-made rifles. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the European rifle, the twists 
Oh yeah, uh, just, a just little their slow. chamber dimensions because they're built for the long, heavy old old, old uh, yeah. bullets, yeah. round nose yeah. shape, slow or all that. So, but that's why we make bullets that are specific for those. We do yeah. chamber yep, the ECX designs. bullet. Yeah. So interestingly, we had we tried some ECX last year. Uh, Warren was yeah, that's our right. stalker yeah. was shooting. He shot two hundred deer with ECX. He thought they were in the three hundred eight. Yeah, yeah, big old lumpy boom, boom you know. Yeah, so she said they were fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> shot loads of deer with it. The Hornady CX Copper Alloy Expanding Bullet. CX bullets feature the advanced heat shield tip that resists aerodynamic heating and provides a consistently high BC. Hard hitting and deep penetrating, CX bullets are constructed of rugged monolithic copper alloy that retains 95% or more of their original weight for devastating terminal performance. Available in factory loaded ammunition as well as component bullets for reloaders. CX bullets from Hornady. We should also talk about some other amazing equipment that you guys utilize, your dogs. Oh, so, yeah, that's something so, in America we don't really do for big game. No, and it's, it's so, it, <laughs> man, we're missing out because it's so much fun to watch these dogs. He has a dog named Millie that he's had for a long time, and she will tell you when a deer's around. Now, here, it's something else that's interesting, when I first went over there to hang out with Mike, we didn't have thermals. It wasn't a thing back yeah, then. Now, now they're using thermals because they're in this dense forest, and they can use thermals to locate game and things like that. So that, that's a game changer too. But the dogs will see these animals mm -hmm. and sense them before you can see them with a the thermal. So. Yeah. Uh, my, my old dog, Millie, she's a Labrador cross with a sheepdog with a collie. And then I crossed her with a Scottish deer hound and got this big hairy thing called Sorrel. <laughs> yeah. And they're both hell on wheels. They're amazing. Wow. And they've been stalking deer with me since they were eight weeks old. So they just stalk here. I don't think anything about it. They're Not just, really trained, just been out just, with them all the time. Yeah. So they, 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 they sort of hang out around here and they're like this. A pheasant will walk three feet in front of them. They just don't even see it. Mm. A hare will walk. They don't see it. They, they have only their total focus on deer. And Millie will suddenly go like that. And, and you look because I guarantee there's a deer up. Mm -hmm. She's got six. She's nearly 12 and she's still at it. Oh, wow. Um, That's fascinating. And as soon as you crack a shot, off. They're gone. Yeah. yeah they're going to go and uh, get on that deer for you. So they'll, I'll shoot. I'll shoot another one. And the dogs will be like this. <laughs> yeah, just like, eh. It's it's just like a dog in a yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah. and then, uh, and then I'll be like, and the dogs, the dogs line up with the rifle barrel when I'm looking at a deer, right? You'd see them like that. Yeah. So wherever the barrel's pointed, the dog's head's pointed. They've just figured it out because they're wolves. They're clever yeah. animals. 98% wolf, right? So the wolves, we, we, we originally uh, domesticated wolves to help us hunt. It's really simple. Mm -hmm. Turn them into dogs. I've done that with deer. It's so easy to train a dog to do deer. You can chain, tame it. The only dog I reckon you can't train to do deer as we do is a Jack Russell. Yeah, I was going to say for a Jack Russell. <laughs> so I've got two of those. Yeah, dogs. he's going to go chase everything. The little little devils. So they're like, yeah, really? I love them, but <laughs> yeah. But if I if I took the Jack Russells out to find a deer, they'd be amazing. Yeah, they go track them. And they track them, but but forget walking to hill. Like you know, it's just fun to watch, and it is something that we're missing. Of course, we don't typically you know, do spot and stalk through the forest like, like it's done in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, it'd be great if we did. And unfortunately, there's probably some deer chasing laws with dogs that might be a problem, but the place where it could be really beneficial is for elk hunting, I think. Oh, yeah. You know, if you're, if you're out tooling around, because most of the time you're doing a spot and stalk on an elk, and then mm -hmm. when that thing gets shot, you have a dog that can go out there and find that thing for you if you uh, yeah, cause made an air shot or if it runs off into yeah. the... Or an elk will suck bullets up like no thing and then run away as a dead animal, but get 100 yards in a darn hurry. It's just fun to see. I mean, yeah. it's just different than how we do it. Yeah, you know? and they quarter and they figure it out. They know there's a dead deer up there, right? Yeah. Because And I'll tell you, here's a cool thing, and I, I, I've seen this numerous times. And these are dogs with a lot of experience. They hunt 100 days a year. Uh, well, they live on the sofa and they, they, they you know, they, they sleep on beds. and they, I mean, they have no boundaries. Their discipline is non-existent virtually, <laughs> but they're self-disciplined hunting. Okay. And they so I'm not one of these guys on. that has boxes in the back of my car and no, they, they have to sleep in it. They're just right on the back seat, you know. And uh, I want them to have fun with it and they love yeah. it and they eat the hearts. And then yeah. Millie, Millie is a weirdo. She buries every single Yeah, she bit. buries the legs. Or, no, it no, was the, actually the other parts. The yeah. other parts. Yeah. The male and lady bits, yeah. when I cut yeah. them out and throw them over my shoulder, yeah, she goes you turn around and there's a pyramid of grass. Yeah, she's, she's out there them. burying them. <laughs> out by That's, the larder. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just weird. Like, it's like yeah. a squirrel, you know. So, but the dogs are, uh, actually, you know, I don't like stalking without them. I like the companionship. Yeah. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Uh, and 
they help me a lot. I mean, there's a lot of deer I've shot because I make mistakes. We all do. Anyone Absolutely. who says they don't is lying. You know, I, I screw up. If I pull the trigger on anger on a deer three, four hundred times in a whole season or year, <clears throat> I might make three or four mistakes. One percent. I try because I'm very careful. I will not pull the trigger if a deer's moving or mm -hmm. overlapped, whatever. But let's just say that happens. Well, the last two years, I haven't lost one because the dogs have sorted out every single time. Fantastic. Because if I tell you one of the problems that we can have because of herd deer is that. The one thing about the, the CX is that it's a very penetrative round. Oh, yeah. So, and I'm sure you know what I'm going to say, in a herding deer overlapping level... That's a problem. It can be, and it does happen. And so if you have a deer that's been shot, even if I made sure it's clear, that bullet's gone through and it's glanced off. Mm -hmm. Ricocheted out. Every off now and then we'll get a two for one that isn't tight. We don't want that to happen. But then you have to solve the problem. You have you to do. sort it out. And the dogs have helped that a lot, and we... But we Yes, I think we haven't had any issues, but you know, we, we're not, people think this sounds like Nirvana. It sounds amazing. Oh my God, mm. you get to hunt all this time. It's brutal hard work. It is. And especially the stalking aspect. Uh, yeah. We legging and <laughs> de heading 20 some odd deer. 27 deer that yeah. morning. Yeah. I got pretty good at it by the end. Yeah, I, so I, I suppose had, you did. I <laughs> had, I had him, I had Beth and Rob from Savage and the, we have David Draper too. Dave Draper yeah. and we were in this area, we, we between about, over a three-hour period, we managed to harvest about 25 hunting, deer. Hunting Roman deer, because yeah. the Romans brought the uh, fallow over, in ancient Roman ruins. Pretty cool. That sounds yeah. like a very unique we experience. We had a picnic in a Roman temple. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Anywhere else in the world, be a major visitor attraction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. In yeah. England, it's just there. Oh, my so gosh. So, we, um, but we did this, and then these guys, yeah, these guys were like, right, there's six for you, there's six for you, and everyone's at it, and you know. But you we get good at it, and there's, a, there's oh, yeah. definitely a, a, a method to it that mm -hmm. works very well. It's really fascinating and, for me, endlessly challenging. And You know, the next thing I would really like to do, if I'm totally honest, is I would like to replicate deer box here in the U.S. Yeah, well, that would sound like, you know, that we, we do harvest quite a few deer. And but they've got to be, because the federal law dictates that you cannot sell a game species. Right. So if we did, it would have to be invasive species. So it'd mm. have to be fallow, axis, nilgai. Mm. Um, wild boar, things like that. Texas. Texas <laughs> you Hawaii. probably get a, yeah, access deer yeah. in Hawaii. Yeah. There's definitely a bit. I would love to do it because one of the, the only, as I can see as an outsider, I think I can be quite objective. And I spend a lot of time with my American friends. I have so much respect for the North American model of wildlife conservation. It saved your wildlife. Yeah, it did. It saved turkeys. It saved white-tailed deer. It saved bison. It saved elk. It, it's an incredible thing. But what it has led to with this federal rule about not being able to sell any venison, and stop means poaching basically very rarely happens, yada, yada. but it does mean the general public don't get to try it. Uh -huh. And if the general public can't try it, they can't get on board with hunting because where's their connection? That's the good thing. It, yep. You know, have people eating while game would be great because now they're going to be accepting of uh, look, oh, this well, hunted yeah. animal. Yeah, yeah 100%. So, so if somebody who wants to improve their diet, their healthy, their healthy life, mm -hmm. their lifestyle, if somebody wants to do that, and they can go online and buy top quality wild hunted venison. Yeah, yeah. Whether it's white tail yeah. or access, or and then plug in all of the buzzwords: yeah. the organic, free range, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They Which Mike, 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 he should look the way that Mike <laughs> deals with this subject is just perfect because it's irrefutable. Yeah. So we harvest a biological surplus of animals from the environment. Yeah. So, and this is a really good pair of words to think about. Britain is a great example. Block Island is a great example. Some of your states now here, you can kill a doe a day. You can get a doe tag a day. <laughs> yeah, when it's nine day season, you could get. No, but there's 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 oh. not there's there's, there's South states Carolina. with oh, sixty yeah. day seasons where you can kill a doe a day. Oh wow! But what what on earth can you do with that? Yeah, nothing. Yeah, that you can't get. There's only a little fine. So, but here's the thing: where you have situations like we have in Britain. We have literally, there's a holding capacity of land, and over there, there is a biological surplus. We should be making full use of that biological surplus. And that is moral, it's correct, it's environmentally friendly. We have, Britain is one of the least biodiverse countries on earth. We have large mammals, and very little else, because the large mammals eat everything that the little animals live in. Mm -hmm. So what we try and explain to people who go online and say, you're a horrible murderer on my Instagram feed, and I go, actually, think about this. I don't get rude back, I just say, think about it. Actually, where are the predators? We are the predator. I am replacing the wolf, the lynx, the bear. 
or let's bring back wolves. Why? They'd eat yeah. sheep. You know, actually, mm-hmm. they'd eat sheep. Well, that's kind of an interesting subject <laughs> in the United States right yeah, now, but yeah, we better Colorado. not go into that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But they would, in England, they just eat sheep because um, they're a lot easier to catch. They're way easier <laughs> yeah. to catch, yeah. <laughs> way easier to catch. <laughs> so, um, because just because they used to eat wolves, uh, elk and sheep and deer and all that doesn't mean they would now. Right. So, in England, we're far too populous for any form of predatory introduction. Uh, so, actually, uh, a person with a rifle and a motor car are the only forms of deer management that exists in the United Kingdom. Mm-hmm. And that is an irrefutable fact. Yeah. And the biological surplus, they're like, that's a, a great pairing of words uh, that I think anybody can digest. And that's been, that's been interesting uh, since I first heard that, to th- look at it through that lens. Mm-hmm. And you do feel, you know, certainly in, in the situation in England, an obligation to take that surplus uh, because again, Mother Nature takes care of it itself, and it's not as pretty as a nope. single shot kill. And it would probably come in the form of disease mm-hmm. and motor cars. Yep. Yeah. And that's ugly. I mean, I mean the other uh, fences are another problem. Two days ago, I'm driving to go hunting, and I, my eyes are really like I'm driving, and I spent my whole life looking for deer. So I'm driving along any sort of road, and everyone else is listening to a podcast or no, and I'm driving along, and I'm like this, and I see my my subconscious goes stop the car and pulled over on this little country lane. Looked up on the left, and there's a young fallow deer hung from a deer from a fence. Oh, completely gotcha. snapped Achilles tendon, completely hung, poor little thing, fully dislocated shoulder on three legs. It's going. Oh gosh. And it, and, but the problem in Britain is, if I jump out the car with my rifle and shoot that deer, I oh, go so to jail. Still alive, yeah. Yeah, but I go to jail because mm. I'm, I'm shooting a firearm on private land that's not mine. So I had to sit by the side of the road looking at this thing, and it took me 40 minutes to track down the landowner, but I did it. Landowner immediately said, please dispatch the deer right now. So it straight away did it. And that deer is now 12 pounds of jerky at my house. Because <laughs> I, I can't put it into the food chain because it suffers uh, yeah. too much stress. Right. So I used it myself. Uh, I understood. Well, for people that are listening to this podcast uh, that are, are experiencing Mike Robinson for the first time, where do they go to get more information about you, about your TV show? What so are some outlets for them? Farming the Wild. Yep, the TV show on MOTV Outdoor TV Channel. and Outdoor Channel. Wild Game Masterclass, another t- TV show on Outdoor Channel. Okay. And MMOTV. Um, Mike Robinson Chef on YouTube. Okay. Doing fortnightly uh, programs on YouTube now all the time. Like 15 to 30 minute on hunting, cooking tips, the occasional tank. Yeah, the occasional and, tank. Uh, we didn't touch on that. But no. We haven't touched yet, but... It's a problem. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it's where all my money goes. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cruising through southern England with the big hedges, you know, like you've seen in all the shows. And here comes Mike in a tank. Yeah. Yeah. He has well, several tanks. That yeah. We'll have to guide the listener to your social media to so, see your tanks. And then Instagram is uh, Chef Mike Robinson. Chef Mike Robinson. And awesome. uh, names of your restaurants and where they so are. So I have the Harwood Arms in London in Fulham, which has the distinction of being the only pub in the whole of london with a michelin star Fantastic. very good eating you must come when you go uh, you, he's eaten there it's brilliant. his whole family's eaten there <laughs> yeah it's brilliant um so we have the howard arms we have the woodsman in stratford on avon everybody loves it a lot of we film a lot of our tv show that people come over from the state especially to eat there tell them about the uh at the woodsman the uh, wood paneling came from where in there? so we're in stratford upon avon shakespeare's town we're right in a historic 500 year old building and it's directly opposite Shakespeare's house, his school, and the church he got married in. And when his house was pulled down in about 1700, he died in 15, whatever, 1580 or whatever mm-hmm. it was. The guy who bought his house, it was the biggest house in Stratford. That's an interesting story. The, the story goes, and it is a story, I don't know if it's true. Yeah, true, true unless proven otherwise. Yeah. Too right. Yeah. <clears throat> this dude got so cheesed off with tourists 500 years ago turning up to Shakespeare's house. That he knocked the house down, two thirds of it. And apparently, when the wood paneling, you know, oak paneling, mm-hmm. where they used to line drafty Wayne, walls, wainscoting in there, yeah. wainscoting, floor to ceiling, they recycled it and put it in our in our hotel and restaurant. So our cocktail bar, how cool bar, is that? Uh, the paneling came out of William Shakespeare's house when he was living there, from from when he was living there. And it, we built this. We've got a wood fired oven and a charcoal grill in the middle of the restaurant. We got a butchery center. We dry aged meat. We do grilled shoulders, grilled glazed shoulders of roe deer, you know, for two people. We do plates of racks of fallow deer. We do slow braised shanks. Mm. We do pheasant grouse. You ready to book a trip? Yeah, yeah no England. kidding. Come over. And what about time. the and the the original pub? 
And the original pub, uh, which one are you talking about? The pot kiln. Oh, it's not mine anymore. Oh, it's not. It's okay. my ex-wife's. Oh, very Say well. Say no more. <laughs> Sore subject. Sorry about <laughs> that. <laughs> Press and edit that out. Uh, <laughs> but life moves on. Yeah. <laughs> and you never know, one of these days soon, I may have something over here. There's thoughts in the pipeline. That's awesome. Well, Mike, I, I appreciate you sitting down with us, discussing all this stuff about your personal life, your restaurants, the cooking, and then on the technical side. I mean, the experience of shooting animals that many every year with you and your team, uh, you just you can't discredit that type of experience, and you found what works, and we're proud to have you on the Hornady team. Listen, mate, you keep making them because that, that Outfitter CX is just an absolutely legendary round and is, most importantly for us, it's consistent and reliable, and those are the two magic words. Yeah, love it. Well, I'd say let's uh, go back to the show, enjoy what the Safari Club International Show has, and enjoy Nashville. Thanks, man. Lovely no talking problem. to you. Thanks, Mike. Neil, Cheers, always buddy. a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Everybody, hopefully you enjoyed this podcast, a peek behind the curtain of Mike Robinson and all that he's got going on in England. We hope you enjoyed it. We'll catch you on the next one.